right? Our stream is live. Welcome. I guess it's week five now. So this is exam week. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about some new material and then the latter half of today is going to cover whatever your questions are uh, in, in advance of the exam. So we'll be doing maybe 45 or 50 minutes of new material, then we'll take our 10 minute break as usual. And then the rest of the time will be your questions. So I'm gonna do my very best to limit the new material to just the first half of, of the class period. So let's jump right in. So on the agenda today, if you recall from last time we began talking just very briefly about the, the notion of replication, of data replication. So we're going to talk about reasons to do replication, and then we're going to talk today about two replication techniques. And these are both techniques that give you uh, what's called strong consistency. So we're going to talk informally. about what strong consistency means. And then the two techniques that we're going to look at are called primary backup replication and chain replication. And that's going to lead us into the last thing that I want to talk about today, which is latency and throughput. And then all the rest of the time that we have left will be after our break, we're going to do exam review and logistics. So I'll talk a little bit about exam logistics. But this exam review part will be basically whatever questions you want to ask. Okay, so let's get started. So, we started talking last time a little bit about this notion of, of reasons to do replication. Um, and we, we talked about how replication involves making copies of data. So, let's talk a little bit about why, why we do this. So, it's fairly obvious already that if you just have one process and you know that process has some events on it and maybe it has some process local memory like it knows that x is 3 if that process crashes and that's the only process that knows that information that has that state then we're in trouble right because then our data is lost so it's helpful to have another copy we can replicate this thing with all its state. So mitigating data loss is one reason to do this. And it's possibly the most important reason. Now if one of these crashes, now this fact that x is 3 isn't lost. But are there other reasons why you would want another copy of a process aside from fault tolerance? What do you think? Performance, okay, can you go into a little bit more detail about, about that? Yeah, so some people are making good suggestions here, like faster response time, yeah. So if I'm here in Santa Cruz and I want to ask what the value of X is in this key value store, um, and uh, maybe this one is running uh, on a machine in Australia. 
And maybe this one is running on a machine in a data center in Sunnyvale, uh, just down the road. It's probably going to be faster to make the request to the one that's closer to me physically. It's not necessarily guaranteed, right? But, you know, this is the internet, everything's asynchronous, no promises, but it's awfully likely that the machine that's physically closer to me is the one that I'm going to hear from faster. So one thing that you can do is make a bunch of replicas, put them in different places around the world, and then they'll be close to the clients that need them. So one other reason that we can put down here is data locality. So this means having the data close to the clients that need it. Other reasons to do replication. Good. Yeah, somebody just mentioned also distributes the load on the machines. Yeah, it divides up the work. So if we have just one machine, if we're getting a lot of requests, say for the value of one particular key, and we're having a hard time handling them all with one machine, it might make a lot of sense to have another machine to take some of the burden off. So these are all reasons to do replication. What are the downsides of doing replication? Sure, okay. A couple of people mentioned higher costs. Yeah, yeah. one reason is it's expensive. You have to have more machines, right? You either have to buy them or you have to rent them from Amazon or Google uh, or some other cloud computing service. So it's going to cost more money to replicate. And it's kind of, it's, di it's different from, you know, we talked about how fault tolerance often involves making copies. Well, if you want to make a copy of a message to ensure that it's delivered, right? We talked about how uh, reliable message delivery sometimes involves sending a message more than once, right? But with that, you can kind of do it in a um, pay-as-you-go way, in the sense that if a message isn't received, you can send it again. So you don't have to pay the upfront cost of sending the message multiple times. With this, if you wait until the machine has crashed before you get another machine, then you're in trouble. So with replication, you have to pay the upfront cost of having the different copies. And you may not even need the second copy, but you, um, but you have to have that investment. So it's expensive. What are the other downsides? Yeah, a couple of people mentioned. One person said inconsistency. Yep, yep. So this is, I think, the much bigger downside of replication. If you have two copies, you have to keep them consistent. And this can be really complicated, especially if they can crash, right? Which was the reason that we wanted to have replication in the first place, because we want to prevent data loss in case of a crash. But if these two copies are running, we have to make sure that they both stay up to date with each other. So consistency can be complicated, especially if they can crash, which was a reason that we wanted to do replication in the first place and especially if they're physically far apart, which was another reason we wanted to do replication. This idea of having geo-distributed copies of our data so that the copies can be close to whichever clients need them. And it's also hard if they're both serving requests. It's also harder to keep them consistent if they're both serving requests, which was yet another reason why we wanted to do replication. So, another downside of replication, if you want to call it that, and unavoidable trade-off that you have to make with replication is not only is it more expensive than only having one copy, but you have to keep the copies consistent.
I'm going to put off in here because it turns out that a fair amount of the time you can get away without keeping the, the replicas entirely consistent. So I'm going to put this in a box because that's a notion that we're going to come back to later in the course. We're going to talk about when can you get away with not keeping the replicas consistent? Because it turns out that a lot of the time, something weaker than keeping the replicas perfectly consistent is good enough. However, today we're going to be talking about keeping the replicas perfectly in sync with each other, and we'll be a little more specific about what that means. Okay, so. Now that we've kind of motivated the need for replication and the fact that replication involves this trade-off, uh, let's start talking about protocols for doing replication. Well, first let me define this notion of what's called strong consistency. So, This is going to be an informal definition because a formal definition is honestly quite tedious. And what I really want is to give you a more intuitive notion of what it means for replicas to be consistent. And we don't need all the math and all of the formalism to give you that intuitive idea. So here's the informal definition of what we want. We're going to say, a replicated storage system is strongly consistent if clients cannot tell that the data is replicated. So the easy way, of course, to have strong consistency is to just have one copy, right? But as we just talked about, there are lots of reasons to want to have more than one copy. So let's talk a little bit about how this is done. Before I do that, you know, there's another idea that I want to discuss, but I don't know if I'm going to have time for it. So let me just jump right into replication protocols and then we'll come back to this other idea that I'd like to discuss, just in, just in case there's not enough time. I'd like to make sure to get the protocols out of the way. So we're going to talk about a protocol that does strongly consistent replication. And it's called primary backup replication. This is a protocol that is a strongly consistent replication protocol. So it gives you this property that clients can't tell that the data is replicated. So it works like this. You pick a particular replica, a particular process, and I'm going to call it P to be the primary. So P stands for primary here. And then all of the other replicas are considered backups. So let's say that we have one primary, and let's say that we have uh, three backups. And the idea is that clients will only interact with the primary. So here's a client over here. Let's say that the client wants to do a write. So let's stick with our example and pretend that this is a key value store. So let's say that the client is uh, uh, trying to write to the key value store and wants to set a particular key to a particular value. So let's say the client wants to write you know, set x to 3.
that write is going to first go to the primary. When the primary gets a write from a client, the first thing it's going to do is broadcast that write to all the backups. The backups are then going to send an acknowledgement to the primary. So I'll do that in a different color here, I think, to make it a little more readable. Let's see if blue looks different enough from black. I'll do it dotted lines as well to make sure that it looks different. So the backups are all going to send an acknowledgement to the primary. So this message that the primary sends out says set x to 3. At the point when all of the backups have acknowledged the primary, then at that point the primary can tell the client that the write succeeded. So at that point, after the primary has acknowledged the right to the client, at that point the primary is actually allowed to deliver the right to itself. So the backups all delivered the right to themselves immediately after getting it. But the primary only delivers the right to itself after it's gotten acknowledgments from all the backups that it broadcasts to. We call that point right there, the point at which the primary has gotten acknowledgments from all of the backups and then delivered the right to itself. We call that point the commit point. Of that right. And then it can acknowledge the client, and tell the client, okay, that right happened. So that's how writes work. What about reads? What do you think the client is going to do when it wants to read the value of x? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, pick the closest server is the suggestion in chat. So Indeed, picking the closest server would help you get that property that we talked about earlier, that data locality property. It turns out that primary backup is really not very good at giving you data locality. Because with primary backup, you end up doing something else. Instead, with primary backup, the client only interacts with the primary. So the client is just going to ask its question right here. Maybe the client wants to know what x is now and the primary will tell it. So there's no need for a read to be broadcast to the other replicas because the primary already knows what it is, already knows what to tell the client. However, the question kind of anticipates this issue with primary backup replication, right? Because it doesn't give us that property that we thought was so good, that property of data locality. Instead, the client's only talking to this one server, this one primary. Why does it work this way? Why would it not be okay for the client to just go and ask, let's say, B2? Why couldn't the client just go ask B2 or B1 or any of these? Yeah, good point. The right might have, uh, there might have been another right that's gotten to one of these backups but hasn't committed on the primary yet. So let's say another right happened. Let's say the client wrote this. So here the client is updating the value of x. Once again, that has to get broadcasted out. And 
and those have to get acknowledged as well. So what would happen if, let's say, this one acknowledged If the client were to go ahead and read from B1 at this point, maybe the right got here, but the right hasn't committed on the primary yet. So the primary still thinks that X is three. And in fact, the client hasn't gotten any acknowledgement yet that X is three. So the client, all the client knows right now is they've set X to three, then they've set X to four, then they got an acknowledgement of the right that X was three, right? So they haven't gotten any acknowledgement of this right, this second right yet. So as far as the client is concerned, they don't even know if this right got to the primary because they haven't gotten an act yet. So this right, as far as the client is concerned, this right can't really be said to have completed until they get an acknowledgement. We certainly don't want the client to read any rights that haven't completed. And that's what could happen if we allowed the client to read from backups, they could read something that hadn't committed yet. And that's why the writes and reads all have to go through the primary here when you're using this primary backup scheme. Now, you might ask, well, that sucks, right? That doesn't give us the data locality that, I, that we were talking about just a minute ago. And I would agree, yeah, it does suck. Maybe we can do better. So what are the drawbacks to this approach? Well, the primary is a kind of a bottleneck, right? We listed three reasons for wanting to do replication. So there was fault tolerance, there was dividing up the work, and there was locality. So how does, how does primary backup do on each of these things? Well, fault tolerance, it's doing pretty well, right? We have backup copies. And because the write doesn't commit here until it's already reached everywhere else, let's say that the primary crashed. Let's say that the primary crashed before the commit point of a write. Then, or let's say that it crashed, um, yeah, let's say, that, let's say that the primary crashed um, at some point in here. Um, you know that that write has already committed, or that write has already been delivered on all of the backups. So the backups are always going to be at least as far ahead as the primary in terms of how many writes they've delivered. So since the backups are always at least as far ahead, if the primary crashes, we don't lose data. So we're in pretty good shape as far as fault tolerance is concerned. But as far as those other things that we hope to have, data locality and um, dividing up the work, primary backup replication is not so good. Questions about that? Okay, so natural question to ask is, can we do better than this? Can we make it so that the primary doesn't have to do all the work? Any thoughts on how to do that? Ha, huh. a consensus protocol. Y'all are jumping ahead. Make all of them primaries. Okay, but that kind of brings us back to our original problem, right? Of trying to keep them consistent with each other. If they're all primaries and the client can read, to all, read from all of them and write to all of them, then how are we gonna keep them consistent?
No, I'm really glad that somebody brought up consensus because it turns out that this is what we're talking about here is eventually going to lead us to talking about consensus. All right. So we could have backups serve the reads, right? We could have clients be able to read from backups. We could say client gets to make writes only to the primary, but if they want to do a read, they can talk to a backup. But if we do that, then we don't know what we'll be reading. We might actually be reading data that's in some sense from the future. So that's sort of what's happening here in this messy, but hopefully somewhat intuitive bottom picture here. Um, where the client is reading X, and there's this write um, where we where we wrote um, for before, uh, but that write hasn't yet committed, and we haven't heard anything back about that write that second write committing yet. So, if we're, we were to do a read at this point from a backup that already knew that X was for, then our read would be reading from the future in some sense. When we read from the primary we know that we're either going to get whatever, um, you know, whatever has been acknowledged, right? Well, let me propose an idea. We could pick out a particular backup to always read from, and then have that backup acknowledge us when writes to the primary have finished. Let's look at what that would look like. So here's our client. And we're going to keep it the same way as before, where when we do a write, it goes to uh, the primary. So maybe this is our write of set x to 3. And let's keep the same number of replicas that we did before. But let's have it work this way. When we do a write, instead of broadcasting it to everybody, we're going to send it to whichever replica is next. Then that replica is going to send it to whoever's next. And then that replica is going to send it to whoever's next. And let's say that this one knows that it's last. So now this one can acknowledge the client. In this setting, if the client wants to do a read, who are they going to read from? That's right. Reads are going to go to the last one in the chain. We just invented chain replication. So in chain replication, these Processes have particular names. We call this one the head of the chain. I'll call it H. And then maybe you have some middle nodes in the chain, middle links in the chain. I'll call them M1 and M2. And then this one's called the tail, so T for tail. So in chain replication, you write to the head. The head passes the write on to the next link in the chain. The next link of the chain keeps passing it on, and so on until you get to the tail. And then the tail acknowledges the right to the client. So when the client gets that acknowledgement, it knows that since it's getting that act from the tail, it knows that the right got to everybody. So then, reads can go to the tail. 
So where's the commit point in this picture? That's right, the commit point's gonna be right here. So the commit point in this case is actually gonna be on the tail. So how are we doing on our goals of fault tolerance and data locality and dividing up work? So we're still doing pretty well on fault tolerance. We've still got lots of copies. Data locality, eh, we're not doing all that much better than before. We have a particular machine that's gonna, that we're going to talk to uh, when we do writes, and we have a particular machine that we're going to talk to when we do reads. But that may or may not help so much with data locality, right? It depends where those machines are in relation to us and what our balance of writes and reads is. So it doesn't help so much with that. What about dividing up the work? It's a little bit better in that respect. So instead of having all of the writes and reads go to one replica, instead we're having the writes go to one, uh, one replica and the reads go to another. So this is kind of nice, right? It splits up the work in that respect. So we're doing a little bit better on dividing up the work. Lots of good conversation and chat right now. So, there's a great question here. How do these replicas know who's next in the chain? Yeah, so there had better be some way for the replicas to know who's next, right? And there had better be a way for the client to know who the head of the chain is and who the tail is, because those are the ones that the client is going to have to be talking to. So. There's gonna to have to be some way for everybody to know who's who. Of course, there's a similar problem with primary backup, right? The client is going to have to know who the primary is that they're supposed to talk to, and the primary is going to have to know who all the backups are. So if a machine crashes, if a backup crashes, the primary is going to have to find that out somehow so that it doesn't wait forever to get an acknowledgement from a crashed machine. Oops. There we go. So with chain replication, we have this problem, right? Where we have, um, we, we have to know who's who. So the client has to know who the, the head of the tail is, who the, who the head and the tail are of the chain. Every link in the chain has to know, know who's before it and who's after it. Or if you're the head, you have to just know who's, who's next, right? If you're the tail, you just have to know who's before you. So these are important considerations. And we'll maybe talk a little bit more about that in a second. But let's talk about chain replication and what its other advantages are over primary backup replication. So chain replication is a relatively new idea compared to primary backup. Uh, the paper came out in 2004, so if you want to look it up on your own. It's called Chain Replication for Supporting High Throughput and Availability.
and the authors were uh, Robert Van Rennes and Fred Schneider. Published at OSDI, I think. So it's interesting to look at this title. Uh, what do you think they meant by this? What's throughput? Hmm. So the suggestion in chat is you can send a lot more write requests. So what does this word throughput mean? Let's define it. So throughput. We're going to say number of actions per unit of time. So in theory, chain replication could give you better throughput than primary backup replication because since we have one node that's handling the writes and one node that's handling the reads, then in theory, at least, we can handle more requests than if we just had all of the nodes going through the, all of the reads and writes going through the primary. So depending on the mix of writes and reads, chain replication could do better than primary backup replication in terms of throughput. So I'm going to say, depending on the workload, and by workload I mean mix of writes, writes and reads, chain replication could give you better throughput. What kind of a mix is good? What would happen if you have entirely reads? Then is chain replication going to give you any better throughput than primary backup? Yeah, so just to sketch out for you the difference between the two. If chain replication looks like this, for the right path, and like this for the read path. So that's chain replication. And if primary backup looks like this, for the right path, and like this for the read path. So if everything's reads, it's not really going to make a difference. Will it? Because in chain replication, all the backups are going to that same node, the tail node. 
or yeah, all the reads are going to the tail. In primary backup, all the reads are going to the primary. So if it's all reads, chain replication isn't going to help you. What about if it's all writes? Somebody suggests that primary backup gives you faster. So we're not, we're not talking about faster, right? What we're talking about here is throughput. We're talking about number of actions per unit of time. So will primary backup let you do, let's say you're doing entirely writes. Is primary backup better in that situation? What do you think? It's about the same. So if, you're ha if you have entirely writes, chain replication doesn't really help you. If you have entirely reads, chain replication doesn't really help you. When does chain replication help? It's going to be when you have a mix somewhere in the middle. So yeah, the suggestion in chat is when you have a 50-50 mix of reads and writes. That seems intuitive. Like it seems like if you, if you wanted to split up the work nicely, then you would want half of the work to go here and you'd want half of the work to go here. It turns out that a 50-50 split is not quite right because it turns out that reads are a bit more expensive to do. Than, than, or sorry, <laughs> writes are a bit more expensive to do than reads. So if you have a 50-50 mix, you're still going to be doing more work on the replica that's serving all the writes um, than on the one that's serving all the reads. So what you actually want for optimal performance out of chain replication, it turns out that you want a mix that's like maybe 15% writes, squiggle here because this is approximate 85% reads. It turns out that this sort of mix ends up being optimal for chain replication. So if that's not intuitive for you, just think about the fact that it takes more effort uh, to deal with a write than it does to deal with a read. So just, you know, for argument's sake, let's, take, let's say that it takes like three times more effort to deal with a write uh, than it does with a read. Then, if the workload is 15% writes and 85% reads, but the writes take, say, three times more effort, then you're going to be in a situation where that split to 15% writes and 85% reads splits up the work more or less equally between, uh, between the head and the tail nodes. So something like this ends up being more or less optimal. And you can look it up in that paper that I mentioned. And they have some really nice experimental results where they show different mixes of reads and writes and how chain replication performs compared to primary backup under those mixes. Something like this turned out to give you the most advantage over primary backup in terms of throughput. What's the downside, though, of chain replication? We've been singing its praises, but what's not so good about chain replication? What do you think? Well, some folks are talking about crashes, right? Yeah, but 
But that's also an issue with primary backup replication. Yeah, so certainly both of these replication protocols have to do something to deal with the problem of a replica failing. And that might be, you know, maybe a little bit more involved to deal with if it's chain replication because you have to know, you know who's in the chain and if somebody fails somewhere in the chain, then somebody has to be in charge of figuring out that they failed and maybe installing somebody new there and so on. But you have similar challenges with primary backup, it turns out. So that's not really a problem that's so unique to, to chain replication. Ah, there's a good suggestion in chat. It has to do with latency. So, what's latency? Let's just add it at the top here, right here, next to the definition of throughput. Does somebody want to define latency for me? What do you think the definition of latency is? Hmm, units of time per, per work. Yeah, okay, I, I kind of like that way of putting it. That's kind of the flip side of throughput. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna phrase it this way. Time between start and end of one action. So latency, as far as the client is concerned, here's our client, is how long it takes to hear back about a read or a write that they've done. So let's talk about read latency first. Is read latency going to be any different for primary backup and, and chain replication as far as the client is concerned? So this second uh, request down here we're going to say is the read. This top one is going to be the write in both of these pictures. So how do these compare with each other in terms of read latency? Well, either way, there's just two messages, right? There's a request, there's a response. One, re one request, one response. So it looks about the same to me. So don't get confused by the fact that in the Lamport diagram, this one happens to be further away. So that doesn't mean that that machine is actually further away from the client. It just means physically further away. Um, it just means that that's how we drew the picture. So either way, there's just two messages in terms of doing a, doing a read. So read latency is going to be about the same, whether you're doing chain replication or primary backup. What about write latency? So somebody made a really good comment a little while ago in chat. They mentioned parallelism. Yeah. So in primary backup, if the client does a write and it gets to the primary, the primary is going to broadcast that message at the same time out to every one of these backups. And these backups are going to process that write in parallel and acknowledge the primary in parallel. So how long does the client have to wait? Well. How many messages get sent? Well, there's this first request, right, from the client to the primary. And then there's these two messages that get sent out in parallel. And then these two responses that get sent again in parallel. And then finally one more. So all the way around, it's going to be four messages, right? It's going to be the maximum, you know, whichever one of these is slower to hit here.
So round trip of four messages. What happened over here? Well here, these messages didn't get sent in parallel. We had to wait for this message to get here and then this message to get here. So instead of taking the maximum amount of time for these two, we're actually adding them together. It still happens to be a round trip of four in this picture, but what if I added somebody else to the chain? What if this one is the tail? One, two, three, four, five. So now I have a round trip of five. Whereas if I added another one over here, that wouldn't add any slowness, right? It would just be another request happening at the same time as these other ones. So there's some parallelism here. So no matter how many I add here, we're going to have a round trip of four messages where the middle two messages in the chain are going to be the, the, uh, the slowest two in some sense. Whereas here, anytime we add replicas, which gives us more fault tolerance, right? So it might be a nice thing to do in a lot of situations. Anytime we add replicas, we're increasing the write latency. So like so many things in distributed systems, it's a trade-off. So, so I'm going to say CR has worse write latency than primary backup, depending on how many uh, nodes are in the chain. Questions about this? I've already talked about this for much longer than I had hoped to, so I want to wrap it up quickly. But I want to leave you with one last thought. So in order for either of these replication techniques to work, the client has to know who to talk to. Right? In the case of primary backup, they have to know who the primary is. And in the case of chain replication, they have to know who the head and the tail are. I guess I should fix this second picture now that we added a new uh, tail node. Also, the replicas themselves have to know who's who. In the case of primary backup, the backups have to know who to act. Right? In the case of chain replication, everybody has to know who's ahead of them in the chain and, and uh, who's behind them in the chain. So. It's pretty important that everybody agrees who's who. It would be very bad if I thought that one machine was the primary and someone else thought that a different machine was the primary. That would definitely nuke our guarantee of strong consistency that we were hoping for. So regardless of whether it's primary backup or whether it's chain replication, either way, we come back to this problem of agreement, of having to agree on who's who. And it's especially important because from time to time, machines are going to fail and somebody else is going to have to take over. And that's part of the reason we're doing replication in the first place. So if a primary fails, then somebody is going to have to be in charge of picking the new primary and making sure everybody knows that's the new primary. Likewise for chain replication, there's going to have to be somebody who tells clients who the current head and tail are and somebody who knows who's who in the chain. And it turns out that in order to do these things, uh, you need to use some sort of consensus protocol, which we're going to talk about after the midterm. So that's a little bit of a preview of where we're headed next in the course. All right. So let's do our 10 minute break. Let's do our quiz. And then after that, it's going to be time for you to ask any questions that you have. So let's see. 
Here's today's quiz question. And let's return at 425. All right, see you in about 10 minutes.
What time did I say our break was going to end? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. One more minute, one minute warning. Right, yeah, I heard he was recovering. Okay, it's 425, so let's jump back into it. Welcome back. Okay, so this time is for you all. Uh, it's for talking about anything that you want to talk about in advance of the exam. Uh, so, Let's talk a little bit about the, the structure of the exam. So it's going to be all of Thursday's uh, class period, the 95 minutes. Um, of course, if you have DRC accommodations, um, then you have a extension. And it's going to come or cover everything that we've talked about uh, in these first nine lectures. So um, just to... Um, very quickly recap uh, what that is, I can bring up the schedule. And I've updated our course webpage so that the schedule now links to the videos from uh, the first eight lectures. Obviously, the video link for this one isn't up yet because uh, it hasn't happened yet. But um, so here's our schedule on the webpage. And all these links go to the videos. So anything from lectures one through today is going to be fair game for the exam. Uh, is there anything on this list that you would like us to talk about? Okay. Yeah, we can also do questions that have to do with um, with exam uh, logistics rather than the actual course content material. Yeah, so um, some folks are asking about um, whether Canvas is going to spy on you and you know whether you whether you leave the uh, the exam page. Uh, I find that the information that Canvas provides on that sort of thing is um, is really not very helpful. So, um, I I wouldn't tend to look at that stuff. So I, I don't think it should be an issue. Okay, let's just start to write down some of the things that folks are suggesting here. Um, I'll just try to make a list of all of them, and then we'll we'll try to. Um, uh, go through them all. So fault models and fault classification. Um, can we cover definitions and jargon we should know? Well, <laughs> can you be a little bit more specific on any definitions or jargon that you don't know and then um, or any anything that you don't know the definition of maybe that you see on screen right now? Um, somebody wants a review of FIFO versus causal versus totally ordered delivery. Um, somebody else uh, also wants an example of total order. Total orders and partial orders. Uh, delivery in general. Okay, maybe that can link up to this one here. Delivery versus receiving. Okay, that might be enough for now. So, um, yeah, somebody just asked if the material from today's lecture is going to be on the midterm. Yep, it is. 
All right, so let's let's look at fault models. Um, so we looked at um, a bunch of different notions of, of um, let's look at fault classification first. So we talked about a bunch of different notions of, of, of faults. So we talked about crash faults, which are a subset of omission faults. Oops. Yeah, so here's, I'm uh, sorry about that. Um, so here's the list of things that I wrote down. I don't think I got everything that everybody listed, but we'll see if we can get to these. Okay, so we'll start with fault, fault classification. So um, we talked about how crash faults are a subset of omission faults and how those are a subset of Byzantine faults. And this is a bit of a simplification. There are further subdivisions that we could do here, but let's just talk about these as kind of the main ones. So what is a crash fault? Uh, somebody want to remind me? Yeah, so a crash fault is when a uh, when a process uh, stops uh, sending or receiving messages. So as far as anybody else is concerned, uh, it's died. It could be going along having internal events, but no more sends and receives are happening. So that's a crash fault. We say that, that these crash faults, which you know, we represent them on a Lamport diagram usually by just putting an X, this process crashed. We say that crash faults are a subset of omission faults. And an omission fault is when uh, a message is lost. So we say that crash faults are, are a subset of omission faults because, uh, because crash faults are in some sense a, the, the special case of omission faults where all of the messages that are to or from a particular process have been lost. In other words, if you're going to tolerate uh, omission faults, then you have to also tolerate crash faults. So that's why we have this nesting here because tolerating omission faults means that you are also obligated to tolerate crash faults. And then Byzantine faults. This is when a, a process behaves in an arbitrary or malicious way. And that's a superset of, of both of these because a process that's behaving in an arbitrary or malicious way could be pretending to lose messages, right? Or could be pretending to have crashed. So Byzantine faults encompass all of these. If you're going to be tolerating, if you're going to claim to tolerate Byzantine faults, then you're also going to be obligated to tolerate omission faults, which means you're going to be obligated to tolerate crash faults. And then when we speak of fault models, we mean a sort of mental concept of reasoning about uh, what faults can take place. So if we're working within, say, the crash model, we're saying, imagine a world where the kinds of faults that can take place are crash faults. If we're talking about the omission model, we're saying, imagine a world where the kinds of faults that can take place are omission faults, which means that also encompasses crash faults. And if we're talking about the Byzantine fault model, we're saying, imagine a world where all of these could happen. So when you're designing a protocol or an algorithm, one question to ask yourself is, what fault model are we assuming? And then you need to know that because that's how you're going to, those are, that's going to determine what kind of fault tolerance you're going to have to provide. 
think that about covers everything that you might need to know for the exam for this stuff. Um, let's move on. So let's talk about uh, these delivery guarantees. So actually, let's talk about delivery versus receiving. So a couple of people asked about this, and this is this is a pretty fundamental concept. So receiving a message. is something that happens to you. You don't get to control when you receive a message. It just could happen at any time. It's determined by the network. If somebody sends you a message, you could receive it, you know, maybe shortly after it's been sent or maybe a long time after it's been sent. And that's going to depend on the network and latency and know whether it was lost and had to be resent and you know lots of other stuff. Um, so you don't get, con get to control when you receive a message. That's something that just happens to you um, with arbitrary timing. Delivering a message whoops, this is what's done by your mail clerk buddy who's hanging out on a process and deciding what to do with received messages. So delivering a message is a thing you do with a received message. And I should say a thing you do or not with a received message. So you could choose not to deliver a message that you've received. Your mail clerk could get a message and say, well, I don't want to deliver this message yet. Why would you do that? What would be the point of not immediately delivering a message? And what does it mean to deliver a message? That means that you're acknowledging that you've got it, right? You're, uh, if maybe you're, if you're tracking uh, the messages that you've received in a vector clock, you know, your at that point is, is when your vector clock gets incremented. Or if you have some application that's supposed to get these messages, then at that point you hand the message off to the application. So it's when you deliver a message that you record that you've gotten the message and you hand it off to whoever it is who's supposed to get it. So yeah, so the point of not immediately de delivering a message, maybe you're expecting another message first. So that kind of leads us to this, this concept of, um, of FIFO delivery, right? So so a violation of FIFO delivery would be if process one sends two messages to process two and they arrive and get delivered out of order, that's a violation of FIFO delivery or first in first out delivery. To guard against that, the mail clerk on process two, when it gets this message, this second message, could do a number of things. They could, if these messages have sequence numbers on them, process two could look at the sequence number and say, oh, it looks like there's still, still some earlier message that I'm waiting for from process one. So I'm not going to deliver this one yet. I'm going to hold off. I'll put it in a queue. and then bump it down here to get delivered later. So now this is no longer a FIFO violation. Now this is delivery that respects FIFO. Likewise with causal delivery. So here's our violation of causal delivery, our classic violation of causal delivery, where we have some messages that are being broadcast And this message here is going to arrive over at, at the third process, even though this other message is supposed to causally precede it. Well, how do we know that this other message causally precedes it? Because the send of this message happens before the send of this message. If you look at the happens before relationship between those two message sends. 
So how would we guard against that? Well, then once again, the mail clerk sitting over here would have to decide to queue this message and wait it to deliver it until later. So now, it, now this picture is showing causal delivery. Now that we've delayed this message uh, and not delivered it in until the causally preceding messages have been delivered here on process three. And there was also a question about totally ordered delivery. So we didn't talk about how to implement totally ordered delivery yet. So we'll just talk about uh, what it looks like to violate totally ordered delivery. So for that one, recall, we need four processes. And my favorite way to talk about this one is to say we have a couple of clients who are interacting with a key value store. And maybe it's replicated. We've been talking about replication today. So let's say there are two replicas. And let's say we're not doing one of these nice things like primary backup or chain replication that we talked about today. Instead, just suppose the clients are talking to whichever replica they want. Well, let's say client one is talking to both these replicas. And so is client two. And let's say that they're both writing to the same key in the key value store. What happens here? Well, replica one finds out that x is three, then it finds out that x is four, so its state ends up being this. Replica two finds out that x is four, then it finds out that x is three. So these replicas end up disagreeing. So the violation of totally ordered delivery uh, is the way in which these messages are being exchanged. It's not specific to the key value store example, but um, that's the example that I like to use to make this uh, a little bit more real. Um, so this is a violation of totally ordered delivery. We didn't talk yet about how to fix this other than just don't do this, right? We, the, the one way that we've talked about for fixing this is don't have the client talk to more than one replica. So that's what we talked about today. We talked about a couple of techniques for ensuring that uh, replicas stay consistent. And we do it by having writes only go to a particular replica. So this couldn't happen under chain replication or primary backup. But it's not the, uh, but that's not the whole story. So that's something that we'll talk about a lot more post exam. Okay, and somebody wanted to talk about total orders. And partial orders. Uh, so these are mathematical concepts that are useful to know because they come up you know, not only all the time in distributed systems but they come up all the time in computer science. So they're really really good to know. Um, so our, our favorite example of a partial order is the happens before relation. Although that's a special one because it's what we call an irreflexive partial order. So let's talk about what a partial order is. I'll, I'll get to total orders in a second. Uh, let's talk about what a partial order is and then we'll talk about why the happens before relation is special. Um, so a partial order is a set. Um, together with a binary relation which you could write lots of different ways. Maybe you write it like this, maybe you write it like this. In the case of partial order it's an arrow, but you use some notation for it. Let's, let's do this less than or equal to notation. Um, so this relation lets you compare things from this set S. And the relation has to be reflexive. It has to be anti-symmetric. Anti 
and transitive. So reflexive means that elements are related to themselves. So if you have some A that's a member of this set S, A is related to A. Antisymmetry means that if you have A and B that are members of S, then if A is related to B and B is related to A, then A and B are the same. I'll write A equals B here to save space. Uh, I know I could complain about that, but um, just to save space, we're saying A equals B. So if the relation relates A to B and it also relates B to A, then A and B have to be the same. That's what anti-symmetry means. And then finally, transitivity. If you have three elements that are all members of this set S, then if A is related to B and B is related to C, then A is related to C. So those are the properties that a partial order is supposed to have. Our favorite partial order that happens before relation is special. It's not a partial order with all these properties. It lacks the reflexivity property. Why does it lack the reflexivity property? Uh, because it would be really weird for us to say that an event happens before itself. Because the, the, the happens before relation is a relation that relates events, right? When we're talking about happens before, we're talking about relating one event to another. And reflexivity says that things are related to themselves by the relation. But we couldn't say that A happens before A, or that B happens before B, or that Q happens before Q. That doesn't make any sense. So the happens before relation is a special flavor of partial order that we call irreflexive, and that gives up on this reflexivity property. Total orders. How are total orders different? Anyone know? I'm imagining people frantically looking at Wikipedia right now. We actually haven't talked all that much about total orders, but they're important, right? So what's an example of a total order? Well, the events on a particular process are totally ordered, right? If you have a bunch of events on one process, then those events have a total order. There's no, we can't say that any of those events are concurrent. So how can we express that mathematically? So I'll give you a hint. It's going to be all the same stuff that's true about partial orders. So reflexivity, anti-symmetry, transitivity, all those things are true. But then there's going to be an extra property. I'll, I'll even start to write it down for you. So if you have A and B that are members of this set X, uh, what has to be true about A and B? If 
it's a total order. Yep. Good. Somebody just said it in chat. So it's either going to be the case that A is related to B or B is related to A. Yep. I guess I should write it with the same notation I used before. So it's all this stuff about partial orders. So total orders are partial orders plus this extra condition where every pair of elements that's in this set S has to be ordered by the, by the, by the relation. So this isn't going to be the case for all the events in a whole distributed execution, right? If we do like this, you know, we look at all these events here, these events are no longer totally ordered. For example, A and E, those events don't have an order. They happened on different processes. So we're, we can't talk about those events being total, totally ordered. We could only talk about the events on a single process having a total order here. Make sense? Uh, so somebody just asked, what's the difference? Well, like, why did I have to add this um, less than or equals instead of less than here? Well, so that's actually this, this irreflexive thing. So if I had just said this, um, that would be like an irreflexive uh, order um, because this says, um, this would be like l the less than relationship. Um, and A is not less than A. So that would be, but, um, but we're not talking about that. That's right, yeah, so somebody just asked, so all the members of the set have to be comparable. Okay, we have four minutes left. Um, I'm gonna see if we, there was any other uh, questions about what we should go over. I think we covered a lot of the important stuff just now. Um, okay, so one person wanted to know a little bit more about exam logistics. Uh, so the exam will be on Canvas. Uh, it's going to have, I think, I think right now it has 18 questions. Uh, you have 95 minutes to do it. Um, uh, more if you have some accommodation to get more time. Uh, you can look at your notes. So uh, let me bring up our um, some information about um, about uh, uh, academic integrity on the exam. So, as you all should know from having read the course overview, uh, we have a lot of information here about academic integrity. So here's the section about academic integrity on exams. So some of this stuff is going to be quite obvious. Um, you need to work alone on the exam. Here's what you can use. So you can use your notes. Um, you can use the lecture videos. You can use stuff that the course staff has provided. And you can look at materials that are on the web freely available. So it has to be stuff that's findable with a web search, not password protected. Unless using those materials would violate the, the rule that you need to work alone. Here's the important thing that I really want you to internalize. You have to cite any sources that you use. So if you look something up, cite it in your answer. People have gotten in trouble here in the past. Uh, so in particular, something that folks do is, you know, sometimes, you know, with no intention of wrongdoing, they will copy and paste stuff from some uh, source that they find online into their notes as they're studying, but they fail to quote it. So they forget that it's not their own words, then they put it right in the exam. So you might have noticed there are people who put their notes from this course on the web. Um, that's totally a reasonable thing for people to do. So you may have found those. Um, but those are other people's words. So if you're pointing to somebody's else, if you're pointing to somebody else's stuff and using their words, that's a violation of academic integrity. You need to cite sources. You can't copy and paste from the sources. You need to use your own words, not theirs. And then, of course, you can't collaborate with people on the exam or have outside help or use any resources other than those. All this is going to be uh, 
all this information that I've listed here is going to be at the, the beginning of the exam too. And by submitting the exam, you're going to agree to this. Somebody just asked, will you be able to go back to previous questions? Yes. So when you get the exam on Canvas, you'll be given all the questions and you can order that you can answer them in the order that you want to order them. Yeah, if you use something, if you use some external source, um, if you need to look something up in order to answer a question from some external source, you need to cite it. Okay, there was just a question. Will citing somebody's notes found online be a violation of academic integrity if the answers are written in our own words? Um, no, that's okay to do. MLA format. We will not take points off on the exam for improper formatting of your citations. All right. Uh, it's 4:55, but I don't want to. Um, I, I don't want to deprive anybody of a chance to discuss exam-related stuff. So. Um, I got a question privately about um, about Shandy Lamport and somebody wanting to go over that. Um, we're out of time for today, unfortunately, but um, I'm happy to talk about it in office hours. So um, feel free to come talk to me or just um, ask questions on Zulip and I'll do my best to get to them. All right, let's wrap up for today and good luck on the exam. <laughs>